We are so very blessed today to have with us our guest speaker for the McCormick Lectures, um, the Reverend Dr. Um, Will Willimon. He's the professor on practic uh, practice of Christian ministry at the Divinity School at Duke University, and he served for eight years as the bishop of the North Alabama Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church, where he led 157,000 Methodists and 792 pastors in North Alabama. And for 20 years prior to the Episcopacy, he was the dean of the chapel and professor of Christian ministry at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, where he resides now with his wife, uh, Patsy. And we are so very pleased to have you back again, uh, Bishop Willimon, uh, for we have had him in this pulpit before. And uh, Joe, he also said that he thinks he remembers being at Walnut Hill, but I would imagine the bishop's been to like a thousand different places, but, uh, but we're so thankful he's back here in Dallas with us. Uh, just a few words about him. He's a graduate of Walford College and Yale Divinity School, and at Emory University, uh, he got his uh, STD in 1973. He served as the pastor of churches in both Georgia and South Carolina. And for four years, beginning in 1976, he served as the assistant professor of liturgy and worship at Duke Divinity School, teaching courses in um, uh, liturgics and you know, homiletics. And he served as the director of the ministerial course of study at the school at Duke. And, um, and he just really made an impact you know, on the church. And a lot of us who were entering seminary in the 1980s in particular um, with his writing uh, and his preaching. Uh, he's been awarded um, honorary doctorates from 13 different universities. And he's the author of roughly 100 books. And his worship as pastoral care was... Uh, his, his book called Worship as Pastoral Care was selected as one of the most, the 10 most useful books for pastors in 1979. I entered seminary in 1981. In 82, we were taking all of our pastoral care courses and preaching courses. And guess who we read? The young author out of Duke, Will Willimon. And it was impactful. Now, a survey conducted by Baylor University named him one of the 12 most effective preachers in the English-speaking world. Now, when the Baptist can say that about a Methodist preacher, that's pretty big, isn't it? And I concur. A former student, Michael Turner, said about Will Willimon, first and foremost, Will is a pastoral theologian whose primary message is that the God revealed in Jesus matters for everything in life. Thus his most influential work has been in calling the church to be a faithful witness to the God revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And in the same book they also say, Will Willimon, it seems, never tires of telling the church just how distinctive our way of life should be because of the particular God who has captured us. He has served as a trustee of Wolford College, Huntington College, Birmingham Southern College, and Emory University. And now let's give Bishop Will Willimon a warm LLUMC welcome. Thank you, Bill. What an honor it is to be in this lively, uh, diverse ministry congregation that many of us look to for hope. I told my wife, I said, you know, I'm looking forward to this weekend because not everybody in Texas or elsewhere appreciates my humor, but I'm going to the church that's been the uh, uh, exposed to Stan Copeland's humor uh, over over these years, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, well, have any of you ever seen Jesus as angry uh, as 
you have seen him this morning. In this gospel assigned for the third Sunday of Lent, Jesus' tirade at the temple. Now, Mark, Matthew, Luke, they save Jesus' temple tirade uh, till later in the gospel, last week of Jesus' earthly ministry. John puts it right up here, up front. One of the first things Jesus does in the gospel, as if to say, I'm getting ready to explain to you the rest of the Jesus story by, by this event. Jesus shows up at the temple, the center of Israel's national identity, the, the center of biblical faith, the temple. And he walks in the temple, he makes up whip out of cords, and he drives the money changers out of the temple along with the doves and the sheep and the cattle. He turns over their tables. The coins all spill down the floor. And as, as Jonathan read it so well uh, this morning, he, he, you stop making my father's house a place of business. And then Jesus says enigmatically, I will destroy this temple. And in three days, build it back. What? This temple's been under construction for over 40 years. Uh, John enters the story and explains, hey, he, he wasn't talking about the temple. He's talking about the temple of his body. Yeah, his, his body was destroyed. Three days later, he's resurrected. Get it? Jesus is the new temple. What is the temple? The temple is the biblically assigned way you get to God. And God can get to you. You want to be close to God? Going through a tough time in your life? Looking for a little spiritual boost? Looking to connect with the divine? Well, read the Bible. It's exactly how you do it. You go to Jerusalem... And there with the money changers, you exchange Caesar's idolatrous coinage uh, for the right kind of money. And you buy, as prescribed by biblical law, you buy a, a dove. And then you have a theologically trained, certified, credential priest take that dove and sacrifice it on the high altar. And you will be brought close to God. But, well, what if, you, what if you live a long way from Jerusalem and it's very hard to get to the temple? Oh, I'm sorry. But, but, but what do you do if you ain't got enough money if, even to buy a dove? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No reconciliation to God for you. Uh, no. Uh, and into this system... Of, of religion, Jesus barges in and turns the tables over and spills the coins out into the floor and says, you, you've turned my father's house, God's gift to you, you turned it into the, the, the den of thieves. Uh, it was the maddest, meanest, anybody had ever seen Jesus. Uh, in the story, a, a number of claims are being made. Jesus, the new temple. Jesus, in his body, in his words, in his work, he's the new way to get to God and for God to get to us. Uh, what, what do you do if you had a, a really big sin? What if, what if there's a huge gap between you and God? Oh, well, then you, you're going to have to uh, get get a sheep to be sacrificed by the priest. Uh, uh, turtle doves won't work for you. Uh, you got to get a sheep. And all. no, now Jesus, Jesus, the new temple, the new way that God is busy getting to us, and we can get to God. That's a nice thought. But John is saying even more. Not only that Jesus comes to us, bringing God to us, 
and that through him we can get connected to God. But also, Jesus is the one that comes in to God's house, the Holy of Holies, the temple, and turns over the tables and drives out that which uh, perverts the worship of God and, and he judges. Uh, anybody here ever had the temple that is to bring us close to God get in the way of God? Anybody here ever had the church get in the way of church? Uh, I remember coming out of General Conference, uh, which we're getting ready to have again uh, in spite of everything, um, uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina this year. Anyway, I walked out of the last General Conference. I was so disgusted and just so concerned about the damage I thought had been done to our church. And uh, I said uh, to a friend walking out, I said, that was the most... Uh, uh, d d d disgusting thing and just ungodly and he said oh really he said I it uh, brought a scripture to mind I said you look at that and thought of a scripture and he said yeah yeah uh, Luke 23 24 I said well you know I'm a Methodist and we're not that good on scripture references you know pinning them down what is 23 24 he said I think it just it's perfect for this just Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I said, uh, okay. Anybody ever had church get in the way of, of being church? Uh, behind this story, where Jesus is so angry, and behind this, I think, is a promise. Jesus promises, I'm not going to leave you to your devices, just going through the motions, just going through church. I promise I'll come in and do spring house cleaning. I'll come in and clean you up, turn the tables over, disrupt, so that there you can be as faithful to me, the new temple, <clears throat> as, as I know you can be. I may have been lamenting the current dissolution in the United Methodist Church and the problems and all. And I said to the at Duke Divinity School, the students, I said to them, you can't serve the same church that I served. Uh, it's, it's, it's so much is going to be dismantled. We're not going to be able to afford to have a $10 million general conference every four years. That, that, that's over. We can't afford all these boards of agencies anymore. A lot of our institutions are going to be under stress. Some of them are going to go away. And a student sitting there looked around at his fellow Divinity School students and he said, is anybody here at Duke Divinity School that has been brought here by burning desire to one day be a delegate to General Conference? <laughs> Is any of y'all that are here in Divinity School on the basis of an email from the Board of Global Ministries? Because if you are, you're sick. <laughs> he went on to say, there's no good reason to be here but Jesus. Well, Thank you. Sometimes while we're busy being church, Jesus has got to come on, maybe turn a table or two over, disrupt things, the order of worship it could come in, and so we can be in church. My favorite theologian, Karl Barth, said, Christians go to church. To make their last stand against a living God. That's the, the warning under, under which we work. Our, our human built temples, religious practices, uh, isn't it ironic how even that 
can be utilized by our sin to, to keep us away from the living, demanding, holy, righteous God. The promise. Sometimes that God has to come in and turn some stuff over and disrupt some stuff uh, and say some things we would never have said to ourselves. And uh, in order that, that we can be with that God. Maybe I was following the lead of your pastor and maybe... I was saying some snide, derogatory things about some of the people attempting to uh, uh, destroy our church. And uh, I was, maybe, I was lamenting about the behavior of some bishops in Texas. I anyway. Uh, and this divinity student said to me, uh, can you be sure that Jesus is not behind some of this? I said, what? And said, well, you know, as Christians, uh, when, when you come to something that uh, upsets you, or you, 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 could, you know, sometimes as Christians, you can't tell whether you're at Good Friday or at Easter, you know? You know, I mean, sometimes, sometimes God rips some stuff off from you in order to give you something different. And I said, thank you. Sit down. That's enough. <laughs> it's, uh, there's good news. Jesus Christ, I think here, the implication is, I promise I'm not going to leave you on your own. <laughs> I'm going to feel free to barge right in anytime I want and cleanse your substitute temples so that you can enter the temple. Uh, some people who say, have been saying the last couple of years to the United Methodist Church, uh, we, I, I'm, I'm sorry, we just can't worship God with y'all anymore because we love scripture so much and you love scripture. We, 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 we're just so, and and having you and some of the things you believe and all, we, we, we just can't be here. And so we're going to leave and we're going we're gonna to have a more purified uh, denomination. We're going to have a better church and all. Oh, oh, but, oh, oh, but we can't hey, because we just love the Bible. We take the Bible so much more seriously than you take the Bible. Oh, but we can't leave unless we're allowed to take the parking lot and the buildings and the Methodist hymnals and the folding metal chairs and metal tables, and if you don't give them to us, we're going to sue you. And, and I said, thinking of John 2, I thought, Ooh, show me where's your biblical justification for that being your definition of church. Where do you get that out of Scripture? Uh, and part of being a Christian, part of the challenge, I think, is to have your life open to Jesus barging right in anytime he pleases and messing with all of your sure, certain religious stuff and throwing a lot of it out that you just thought, oh, I just can't worship God without that. I've got to have that. Oh, I've got to believe it. Yeah, that's a living God does that. I got a friend who says, well, you can tell the difference between a living God and a, a, a dead God, that is an idol, that is a God you produce yourself, is that a, 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 a dead God will never shock you. Well, this morning we get shocked. Jesus finally shows up at the sacred temple. And when he does, he just cleans house. Easter week in Alabama, tornadoes blew through the state. We lost 
destroyed seven United Methodist churches in one afternoon. Four United Methodist parsonages were lost. That Wednesday, I stood in the rubble of a church, a 150-year-old church, rubble, and uh, pews stacked up on each other, uh, hymnals blown out into the field, people crying, and I stood there, and I said, I want you to know the annual conference is behind you all the way. I want you to know we will rebuild. We will rebuild. I want you to know that you should be thankful that the conference forced you to buy insurance. We're, it's going to be, we're going to rebuild. And then we had prayer. And then on my way back to my Bishop Mobile, uh, the pastor walked out with me and he said, whoa, yeah, thank you for coming, but uh, that was kind of embarrassing. And I said, embarrassing? He said, yeah, yeah, what was all that? We will rebel. We will rebel. What was all that about? And I said, well, but, but we, 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 we're going to rebuild. That is what we want, isn't it? He said, well, that may be what you want. But, uh, Bishop, you didn't know, you know, we got right down, we got one mile down the road, there's a uh, uh, United Methodist Church. It's all black. We're all white. The pastor and I there, we've gotten together. We have, we have prayer every week. And through that prayer, we felt God is leading us to get these two churches together. It's wrong that we're separate. And, uh, oh, we've had some choir exchanges. We've had a pulpit exchange. But, uh, you know, not the people resisted it. Nothing has come of it. Uh, now, Bishop, I'm not saying that God sent them tornadoes through Alabama last week uh, to teach us a lesson. I, I'm not saying that Jesus was behind that tornado that tore up our church. I am just saying that next Sunday, we're all worshiping in one building together. That's all I'm saying. Well, I said to him, that's, that's more of a Jesus than most Methodists have the courage to worship. Wow. Can it be that the times in your life, the times in your church where there's dismantling and overturning and loss could be times when Jesus is being busy bringing us closer, ever closer in, into life in the new temple. One of my district superintendents, we, just for annual conference that year, we were, I was asked to superintendents, what are the Methodist churches that, that are up for closing this year at annual conference? And he, and he said, uh, well, we got one, Pleasant Green. I said, Pleasant Green? Wait a minute, I was just at Pleasant Green a couple of years ago. They seemed like they were doing fine. They're closing? They, they. And he said, yeah, yeah. He said, it uh, really, really just it happened in the last year. And I said, Why? how did this happen? What, what went wrong? He said, well, I don't know, you know, if this is wrong, but the uh, story I got was... Uh, they were, one Sunday, these two women showed up with their two adopted children and uh, to worship. And uh, there were a couple of calls to the pastor the next week. And they said, you know, now, I, I personally don't have anything against people like that. that that's okay. But I just, uh, I just don't think they would be happy at our church because they... They, they represent a kind of, you know, a lifestyle and, and it, it's different than our style. And, and next Sunday, they must have liked what happened because at church because they brought back three of their friends. And uh, so that's when it hit the fan and uh, they started calling the preacher and they just said, preacher, <laughs> these are not our kind of people. Uh, 
preacher. Uh, th th surely they can find a church that's more suitable to people like them somewhere. And uh, anyway, church shows up sides. There was a big fight. There was difficulty. People got our feelings hurt. People left. People. Anyway, he said, uh, and he looked around at the district superintendents in the cabinet. And he said, y'all tell your churches, you don't want to do anything that makes Jesus mad. Amen.